All right, let's take it from the top. I feel like for the longest time, many of the biggest properties have been practically impenetrable. A hundred years ago, the worst thing you'd have to worry about with something like this would be keeping your Sherlock Holmes novels in the right order, or maybe more taxingly, something like Conan the Barbarian. The thing is though, in the past century, media has expanded. And even if you keep on top of things like all the films and shows connected to a franchise, there's still bundles of things you're missing anyways. One of the most difficult mediums to get into these days for many, many reasons is comics. You can say you're a fan of Batman, for example, but still there's always this looming fact that there's thousands upon thousands of stories featuring him that you haven't gotten around to yet. So starting here, we're going to take a look at one of the two big comic book publishers and talk about them from their foundation up to the modern age. Think of it like a guidebook to DC Comics. We'll be talking about characters, stories, movies, everything that's worth discussing. We're going to take it simply, so by the end of it, whenever that winds up being, you can say you're a true blue expert on all things DC. My ultimate goal is to provide a breakdown and guide to the DC Universe in order of creation so it isn't quite as overwhelming. If you have a favorite character or story and it isn't in a video, it's likely to be found in a video coming later down the line since we're doing everything step by step. So, to the newbies, welcome, and to the oldies, welcome back. Let's talk about DC Comics. So, it seems appropriate to start our journey through the annals of DC's history with its founder, Major Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson. The Major, as most people refer to him as, was born in Tennessee in 1890. After his father abandoned the family and Malcolm's sister passed away quickly thereafter, he and his mother had to move to a relative's house in New York City when he was four. His mother, Antoinette Wheeler, sometime shortly after that point, joined a women's magazine company and made another move, this time to Portland. After that move, Antoinette remarried to a fellow named T.J.B. Nicholson and hyphenated her name. Malcolm, a big fan of his new stepdad, followed suit. Into his adulthood, Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson joined the U.S. Cavalry and went to a staggering number of places during his time with them, interestingly including a secret mission to the Mongolian border. During his service, he found love while stationed in Paris, meeting the aristocratic Elsa Björkborn and honeymooning in Scotland. The thing is, though, the Major was a man ahead of his time when it came to social issues, and this came to a head while serving in the military. As a U.S. Major, Wheeler Nicholson oversaw a squadron of African-American Buffalo soldiers, who he viewed as both capable and of equal standing to the other members of the military. Being the 1920s, this rubbed his superior officers the wrong way. He was constantly mistreated for his views on equal rights, and in turn tried his best to fight back against this. He inevitably sent a letter to President Harding arguing about the situation, which probably only made things worse. Then he was taken to court by his superintendent for insubordinate behavior, and then things violently reached ahead when he was shot by a fellow officer although the exact details of that incident are a little fuzzy. After all of this, the Major was discharged and wound up living a civilian life once again. In 1924, responding to a new calling, he found himself writing for pulp magazines, and a year later opened a publishing house called Wheeler Nicholson Inc. About nine years later is when DC Comics itself finally begins. The business was originally named National Allied Publications, the more recognizable title coming later on. The Major had always found it curious that comics up to that point were collections of things like pulp stories and newspaper strips, and never wholly original creations. He saw this as an untapped market, 
and set to work on a plus-sized comic magazine called New Fun. It was later published in February of 1935. That doesn't mean it was a cut-and-dry process, though. Heck, it wasn't even that big of a success. One of the first problems foreseen by the Major was to do with recognizable characters. As is the same nowadays, most people are far more willing to risk their money on characters they already recognize over an unknown entity. He wanted to use someone from fiction that people would be interested in, but just honestly couldn't find any that weren't already licensed elsewhere. So he made do with new protagonists. Many of the stories that Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson had a direct hand in drew inspiration from his own lived experience, most especially from his time in service. So National Allied began, and immediately began to struggle fiscally. The Major knew this was likely too, and intended to expand fast in order to have their name in the market more prolifically. But coupled with their finance issues and inconsistent publication cycles, they didn't get very far very quickly. In fact, Malcolm became infamous for his inability to pay his employees on time. There's even a record of employees overhearing a conversation he had on the phone with his wife after they couldn't afford to pay the milkman. Needless to say, things were tough. Making his biggest play to finally start making money instead of losing it, Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson hired Harry Donenfeld to help back his third magazine, Detective Comics. But Donenfeld seemingly had some plans of his own in mind. After a time working together and knowing where Malcolm was financially, Donenfeld gave him some money to pay for the Major and his family to take a trip to Cuba, a seemingly unexpected act of kindness. But when Malcolm returned from the trip, he found the business's locks had been changed, and old Harry had done enough legal mumbo-jumbo during his absence to become the company's new owner alongside his longtime business partner, Jack Leibowitz. So, that's it then. Wheeler Nicholson started the company, and only three years later found himself locked outside of it. Without much to do about the situation, as unfortunate as it was, Malcolm returned to writing articles and living a private life away from the comic book industry. Now I think it's time to switch to the other side of the story, as upsetting as it may be. So, Harry Donenfeld, someone I'd describe as a real mixed bag. Donenfeld was born into a Jewish family in Romania, immigrating to New York's Lower East Side around the age of six. From there, his father passed away when he was 15, being left as the sole financial provider to his mother and three brothers. Because of the necessity of his situation, Harry dropped out of school and became an energetic clothing salesman, gifted with silver-tongued speech and the social skills of a swindler. Once the First World War was underway, Donenfeld was drafted and succinctly reported the difficult situation that would put his family into, leading him to avoid joining the military. At one point or another, his brothers opened a printing company, and Harry hopped on board. But this proved to be the start of his worst recurring business model. You see, Harry had this habit of becoming a part of a business during a time of struggle, then becoming the owner when things reached a breaking point. After this first time with his brother's printing company, most future instances were due to those companies incurring large debts to his printing company. But under the company, he made some smart and sometimes even well-intentioned choices, including distribution of women's liberation leaflets, and separately, under the table, producing his own erotic pulp magazines like Spicy Mystery and Spicy Western, which were distributed alongside bootlegged whiskey. I mean, it isn't that hard of a step to take, I suppose. By that time, he'd already made friends with known gangsters like Frank Costello and Meyer Lansky. But time marches on. Donenfeld made legitimate business partners with Jack Leibowitz, and the two shift gears after the Prohibition wraps, setting their eyes on national allied publications. Now, to be fair, it's unclear if Donenfeld and Leibowitz in any way manipulated Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson into going further into debt, or if they simply took advantage of an already bad situation, but in either case, they don't really come out looking like the good guys in this story. But, as mentioned in the previous profile, Donenfeld pulled some trickery, 
While Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson was on his trip to Cuba, Harry submitted the company for bankruptcy, and then bought it up in the auction with Jack and became the new duo in charge of the operation. And that's essentially the story of DC's inception, but Harry's story also has a sad epilogue. Decades later, in 1962, Harry Donenfeld was set to marry his second wife, but a week before the ceremony, suffered a traumatic brain injury, irreparably impacting his memory and speech functions. Sent to a care home to live out the rest of his days in this dramatically impaired state, Donenfeld passed away three years later due to further complications relating to his brain injury. It's odd, isn't it? that these two vastly different people would be the starting point for such a wide and expansive narrative universe. That Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman, all of it, started with a major and a mobster. And that's where we'll leave our story for now. If you liked the video, give it a like. And if you liked me, go ahead and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.